5 on animals. This unit has four main components. The first that we'll go through is the diversity of animals. In 5.2 we'll be looking at the life histories of some insects. In 5.3 we'll be looking at some economically important insects. And in 5.4 we'll be investigating social insects. Unit 5, Animals. And these are the slides for 5.1, Diversity of Animals. And in this lesson you're going to be learning about the diversity of animals in terms of their size and distribution. You'll learn about vertebrates, such as mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians and fish. What are the common characteristics of these groups of vertebrates and also how to distinguish vertebrates from invertebrates. Diversity of animals. So the variation among animals is called the animal diversity. And they vary in a lot of ways, including size, shape, their behavior, and many other characteristics. Oh, there's over one and a half million living animal species which have been described and potentially many hundreds of thousands more that are yet to be described or may have previously existed on this planet. The word animal comes from the Latin word animale meaning vital breath or soul. So all animals they've got a few characteristics in common. They are multicellular. Their cells do not have a cell wall and chloroplast. They are characteristics of plants. And they're also heterotrophic. So this links in with the lack of chloroplast. They can't make their own food. If they were an autotrophic, that would be a plant. And autotrophic means they are a primary producer. So all animals are heterotrophic. So some animals have got certain characteristics and others may lack them while still being an animal. What we've got here is an image of a chimpanzee, which is a mammal. And we can see that within that mammal's body, it has got blood, which is transporting oxygen around its body and also sugars and so forth. That blood is comprised of WBC, so white blood cells, which help fight off infection. Also platelets, which help to uh, coagulate the blood or stop it from, if you get a cut, to stop that one from bleeding and form a little scab. Red blood cells, that's where the oxygen transports around. And also something called plasma, which is where the body will help to uh, excrete waste products. The animal of the chimp and also human is very similar. We contain not only this blood but also cartilage, ligament, tendons and bone which you have learnt about in a previous unit. Animals have different sizes. They can be tiny so microbes um, to the size of the blue whale, which is the largest living animal on Earth. This here is a mi example of a microscopic animal. It's a flea. Um, called a, this type of flea is called a rotifer. You can see them swimming around in water. And of course, here is a whale. This one is a sperm whale. They can grow up to around 10 meters plus long. Uh, the blue whale can be even greater in size than that. They're both animals, so they share characteristics, but there's a huge diversity in size of animals, and there's different advantages and disadvantages that come with being either really, really small or really large. Animals are widely distributed. So they're found in all parts of the planet, in all different conditions and climates, including 
Antarctica to the deepest parts of the ocean. Animals which are on land are known as terrestrial animals, and they are found either on the land or sometimes actually living within trees, and they're known as arboreal. Some animals are found mostly in the air, such as birds, and they're known as aerial animals. Some birds spend over 99% of their life in the air, whereas others will spend, they may be terrestrial birds, such as uh, penguins, but they also go in the water, so they may also be aquatic. So literally all environments. So we're gonna now just f have a look at the differences between vertebrates and invertebrates. Do you know what the difference is between the two? Well, the main thing, there are, there are a few characteristics, but the main thing here is the fact that vertebrates have got a backbone. The crab there does not have a backbone. And there's lots and lots of animals that are invertebrates, and also lots that you may know of that are vertebrates too. There's that backbone. Vertebrates can be further classified. And we've got mammals. When I was talking about the chimpanzee before, that was another example of a mammal. Humans are a mammal. The whale is a mammal. So they've got blood, they're breathing air, they reproduce live young. Birds, they're also vertebrates, but they are different in a few ways. Well, one example, bird, birds lay eggs. Reptiles, different again. Reptiles generally will lay eggs too. Um, and they are uh, different in, in a few other ways, and we'll go into those details in a bit. Amphibians, like your frogs, and also um, tadpoles in their life cycle. Fish are a separate group of vertebrates too. All of these groups have a backbone. Okay, They're all vertebrates, but they share different characteristics within those groups. All mammals, so we've talked about mammals here. These are all grouped together because they've all got hair or fur. They've got uh, these ears with pinna. They give birth to a live young. They've, they will breastfeed milk to their young. They've got lungs, that's an important one. Think of dolphins and whales. They are mammals. Even though they live in the water, they've got a set of lungs and they come up to the surface to breathe. And they're warm-blooded, so they maintain their own body temperature. So there's a few examples of some mammals. Can you think of a few more? Now let's talk about birds. What do birds all have in common? Well, yep, feathers. That's an easy one. They also will have a beak. They do have ears, but no pinna in them. And they have got wings. Okay, that's a big one. They're flying around. They've got this special adaptation of wings, and that groups them together. Birds also have lungs, but they're a little bit different than mammal lungs. They've got a very efficient system of getting oxygen into their bodies, and it's a several chambered system that allows that oxygen exchange to be very efficient because you know they need quite a lot of energy for all that flapping around they do. And as mentioned before, birds lay eggs. And they're also warm-blooded. Here's a few examples, ostrich, penguin. Can you think of any other examples of birds? Now let's talk about reptiles. We've got a turtle there, we've got a crocodile. How are they similar? Well, they've got scaly skin. Snakes can be reptiles as well. They lay eggs. So even though turtles live in the ocean, they still need to go to land to lay eggs. They also need to breathe from the surface, so 
They have got lungs as well, but they are cold-blooded, which is interesting. Most of the others are not. That's why like snakes like to lay out in a nice sunny area to warm themselves, and they're not very active when it's cold. Now amphibians, these need to keep their skin moist all the time. They are cold-blooded. They lay eggs in the water. This is what groups them together. And the life cycle of a tadpole is interesting because it turns into a frog, actually lives some of its life in the water, and it starts its life with gills, so it's able to get oxygen out of the water. The adult has got lungs. Very interesting animals, amphibians. How about fish? So all fish have got scales, scaly skin. Most of them lay eggs, but some give live birth. They live only in water, and they've got gills. That's probably the big characteristic that defines them. They're able to get oxygen out of the water, and they have got something called a lateral line, which helps to sense their environment, sense where other fish are around them. Of course, they have got fins to help them navigate through the water and swim. And these are cold-blooded vertebrates as well. Then we move on to invertebrates. Remember, these are the ones without a backbone. And there's about 98% of the total number of species on Earth are actually invertebrates, which is a huge portion. Here are some examples of some of those. Jellyfish is the cnidarians. There's also mollusks. There are also uh, sponges, worms, crustaceans, spiders. Lots and lots of animals do not have a backbone. The most successful group of these are the arthropods. Let's talk about them. Arthropods, they have got a exoskeleton and a segmented body. So all of these animals here that you can see are arthropods. Exoskeleton, a skeleton around the outside and segments in their body. They've got jointed limbs and they and sorry, they have jointed limbs and that can be further divided into four major classes. Insects, which you'd be very familiar with, arachnids, these are your spiders, crustaceans, so your lobsters and shellfish. And also the myriapods. So these are like um, segmented worms. So let's summarize what we've just learnt now. Animals are the most abundant and diverse living things. They're found everywhere. Land, in the air, in the water. The animals can be divided into vertebrates and invertebrates. Humans are vertebrates and uh, a group specifically within the vertebrates of mammals and arthropods are some of the most successful and the largest group of animals which are invertebrates okay excellent work now let's just do a few review questions group the following vertebrates into mammals birds reptiles fish and amphibians we got a shark chicken frog alligator puffer fish toad, elephant, turtle, penguin, and a dolphin. Okay, the dolphin is a mammal, yes, it's got lungs and breathes air. Elephant, also a mammal. Chicken is of course a bird, so is a penguin. Fish, puffer fish, that's an easy one. Shark is also a fish. Alligators are reptiles, so is a turtle. Frogs are amphibians, and a toad are also amphibians. Excellent work. Animals with a backbone are known as what? Animals that live on land are something, while animals that live in the water are called aquatic animals. Do you know the biggest land mammal? Do you know the biggest mammal? So vertebrates are the animals with the backbone. Great. Animals that live on land are terrestrial animals. 
The biggest land mammal is an elephant. And the biggest mammal of all is the whale. Can you tell the characteristics of all mammals? They've all got ears with pinna. They've got hair or fur. They give birth to young ones. They breastfeed with that mammary gland and they can regulate their body temperature, often known as warm-blooded. These are the slides for Unit 5.2, Life Histories of Some Insects. And by the end of this unit, you're going to know a bit about insects and a, and a process called metamorphosis. You're going to learn about complete metamorphosis as well as incomplete metamorphosis. So let's just break down what an insect actually is. They've got three main parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The head, of course, is the most easily identifiable part, generally where the eyes are. The thorax is the central part of the body, which is generally where the legs are attached, and the abdomen, which is the posterior or rear part of the insect. All insects have an exoskeleton, which is made out of cuticle. Insects will have three pairs of limbs. And one pair of antennae. So, when you have a look at the diversity of species in the animal kingdom, insects make up a huge proportion of them. About almost three quarters of all um, animals are insects. You've got arachnids there, which are the spiders. If you include spiders, yeah, it's about three quarters. So a huge, huge diversity and abundance around the world. So why are they so diverse and successful? Well, they've got a few characteristics which have helped them out over the years. One they've got a very high reproductive capacity. So they're very good at reproducing and reproducing quickly and making lots of offspring. They're small. This helps too because they require less resources. They've got a waxy coating over their exoskeleton for protection. And they undergo this process called metamorphosis. So metamorphosis comes from uh, two Greek words. Meta means change, and morph means form. So they change form. So metamorphosis change form. There's two different types. There's the incomplete metamorphosis, and this is where you've got an egg. It creates a nymph and then an adult, whereas there's also a complete metamorphosis, where you've got the egg, larval stage, then pupa, and then an adult. Let's have a little bit more of a look in the incomplete metamorphosis. Here we start off with our eggs. They will turn transition into a young nymph, which will then develop into a, a more developed nymph, which will then change into an adult. As you can see, there is a change in how this little beetle uh, looks obviously the size, but also there are changes within the way that it moves and functions. Incomplete metamorphosis, this is a little bit different because there is a complete transition. So from the eggs form a larva, and the larvae then will form a pupa prior to turning into an adult. So there's a complete different change in the form of that animal in complete metamorphosis. Let's just have a look at the butterfly life cycle. Lays eggs on a leaf, which form a caterpillar. The caterpillar will form a cocoon and form the pupa, which will then eventually turn into a lovely butterfly who will then eventually go in and lay eggs again. So in summary, insects are really, really successful and they're everywhere. And one of the big reasons for their success is the presence of that exoskeleton, 
they're really fast at reproducing and being so small. And there's two different types of metamorphosis, complete and incomplete. The complete involves a change of the egg to larva and then pupa before the adult. The incomplete involves the egg and you've got that little nymph before it turns into an adult. All right, time for a few quick review questions. Choose the correct answer. One of the following insects show incomplete metamorphosis. Is it A, the grasshopper? B, butterfly? C, B? Or D, housefly? And the correct answer is A, grasshopper. Question two. Both nymph and larvae, A, look like adults, B, are able to reproduce, C, hatch from eggs, or D, all of the above. And the correct answer is C, hatch from eggs. Write the life cycle for complete metamorphosis. Starts with the egg, it goes to larva, it then goes to the pupa, and then goes to the adult. Complete the life stages of a grasshopper. So this first stage is called the egg, then it turns into the nymph, and then it turns into the adult. So this is an incomplete metamorphosis. Complete the sentence. The change in forms of an organism is known as... Something is the shedding of an insect's exoskeleton. Complete metamorphosis involves something distinct stage. So this change in form is known as metamorphosis. Question two, molting is the shedding of an insect's exoskeleton. And complete metamorphosis involves four distinct stages. These are the slides for unit 5.3, where we're going to investigate some economically important insects. Why are insects important? By the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand a little bit about why insects are important economically, so how they bring in money to the economy and also why they're important for crops, for example. We're going to learn a little bit about the tsetse fly, the army worm, and also the may stalk borer moth. So let's just start jumping into how insects are important for the economy. Well, a big one is the fact that they pollinate crops. We've already learnt about flowers and how they need to reproduce sexually using pollen, and some will require insects to pollinate them. And some crops, in order to be successful, will require insects. Predators of pests. Some insects will actually eat pests, which could damage crops. And there's other productive insects that could be eaten themselves or will actually do useful services for the environment such as recycling nutrients. There are of course many harmful insects, some of which can cause catastrophic losses in crop yields. They can cause diseases, they can damage the actual crop and one example of a uh, not so good insect is the tsetse fly. So it's a vector of a disease called trypanosomiasis. This is something that actually causes a bad sleeping sickness. It can actually be contagious and spread this disease through um, this fly, which will then transfer from animals to humans. And in some places, it's really crucial to set up these barricades against them. There's also something called the army worm. The army worm has a larval stage. And in this larval stage, it feeds on leaves and the stems of crops. 
and therefore it is a huge pest for farmers that are trying to grow this. It can get all amongst the corn there and cause all sorts of damage. They feed together and they actually move through the crops in a big group and sometimes farmers refer to them as an army of these uh, worms, hence their name army worm. Another uh, detrimental insect is the maize stalk boromoth. So this is another a pest of maize, also a pest of sorghum and other crops. As you can see there, there's damage the caterpillars have done. They've bored into the stem and uh, they've caused problems to the internal tissues. And that is another pest that the farmers like to avoid. So in summary, insects, they've got a really great economic importance, so they're not all bad. Some of them are really, really important, but some are harmful, and we've got an ongoing battle to find a balance of the good and bad ones. The tsetse fly is a really harmful one that can affect both cattle and people, and it causes that sleeping sickness. There's also the army worm and maize stalk borer, which are pests of crops. Let's do a quick review here. What are the caterpillars that uh, move in mass armies? What are the vectors for the disease called the sleeping sickness? And what's the pest that attacks the plant stem by forming a hole? The correct answer is army worm for the caterpillars of the night flying moth. Tsetse flies are the vectors of the disease of the sleeping sickness. And the maize stalk borer is the pest that attacks the plant stem. Give a short answer for this. Give two examples for useful aspects of insects. Of course, pollination, predation as well. Define the following terms. Vector, pest. So a vector is any organism that carries diseases or a disease-causing organism. And a pest is any harmful insect or small animal. Which one of the following is a vector? A. Dark moth. B. Grasshopper. C. Tsetse fly. Or D. Butterfly. Question two. Which of the following form a swarm that attacks crops? Is it A the tsetse fly larvae, B, moth larvae, C, honeybee larvae, or D, housefly larvae. So the one that's a vector is the tsetse fly and the swarm that attacks cross crops is the moth larvae. Insects are everywhere. They come in very different shapes, sizes, and colors which allows them to live in almost every habitat. Insects have an important role in the food web. Without insects, our lives would be very different. They pollinate many of our fruits, flowers and vegetables. They are food for amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. And they feed on lots of living and dead things themselves, using their different mouth parts and body shapes. Some insects are predators that hunt other animals. Others are herbivores that eat plants. And some live as parasites on or inside other animals. Others are scavengers and eat whatever they find in their environment. Lots of insects help to break down waste. Without them, dead animals, dead plants and poo would start to build up and make a real mess. Most insects are not pests. Unfortunately, most people know more about the few insects that cause problems than the others that benefit the natural world. Insects help keep the balance of nature. <laughs>